Hello, everyone. For those of you who don't know, I'm Cole Bernhardt. Yes. And I'll be preaching for the next several weeks here. And we're going to be starting a series on the book of Luke, chapters 8 through 9 is what we're going to look at specifically. And the title of the series is The Journey is Hard, But It's Worth It. And we're going to be looking at what's worth it. And the journey is going to be the Christian faith, the Christian walk, the day-to-day life as a Christian. Now, as you see up there, if you can see the picture, that's a picture of Jordan Burroughs. He is a USA Olympic wrestler. He won a gold medal in the last match of the 2012 Olympics. He faced against Iran in the finals, and he won the gold medal. Now, it's a pretty amazing story, if you want to look him up later, of just his journey through there. And it was certainly hard for him. And I think the picture right there just shows that it is worth it for him, holding up the USA flag there, representing his country, winning the gold medal. And I think there are a lot of parallels, actually, to the Christian faith and exercise. And that's kind of why I have a picture there. And really, it was really hard for him, but he knew it was going to be worth it, winning all in the end, not only the physical benefits, but also representing his country. Now, the first part of this series that we have here is friends and family. And that's part one, where we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And then we're also going to be going to verses 19 through 21. That's where we're going to start at today in this journey we're going through. We're going to be looking at what Jesus was doing at this time, how it was hard for him, and also for the other people, how their journey to be with Jesus and live this Christian life was also hard for them, but also because of the friends and family that you get in it. So Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, then I'll go to verses 19 through 21, which started in verse 1. Soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. Now we'll go over to verse 19. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brother are standing outside and they want to seize you. Jesus replied, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you very much for all that you've been doing in this service here and just giving us a a great sunny day today to to worship you and to live for you, Lord. And thank you for all that Todd's done for us and letting him be a true vessel of the Holy Spirit and just the Holy Spirit bringing revival and renewal here. And please just let me be a vessel like that today too and let the Holy Spirit speak through me, Lord. And please let me be able to speak and tell things that you want these people here to listen, to understand, and they can go and take it with them. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us already. Amen. All right, so I've already said that I think the Christian faith is a lot like exercise and how exercise is hard. And, you know, this journey is going to be hard, but it's worth it in the end. Now, how many of you have made a New Year's resolution, not maybe this year or maybe years before, to exercise? Which, yeah, multiple people. And how long does that last about normally? (laughs) Next Mexican meal for Todd. uh, Usually, yeah, not not long, Chuck says. And um, everyone knows exercising is good for you, but it's, it's hard. That's why we, we quit so often so early into it. Maybe it lasts a day, maybe a week, or maybe a couple months, but the few that stick with it, they, they get to reap the benefits of that. Now, we all know the benefits are you not only look good, but you're going to feel good. You lose weight. You're able to have more energy and do some things, and really, that's, as I keep saying, the, the Christian life, you're going to have these benefits. But to start exercising, what have you got to do? You've got to, well, get off off the couch, maybe, or go outside, or you have to do things you didn't do before, things that are different, things that may be hard. And that's the first point here. 
To begin, you must leave your comfort zone. So, and as we have Garfield up there, he's just laying on the couch. You, you got to exercise. You sure you could exercise in your house or maybe you go to a gym and you exercise there, but you had to leave what you were doing before, where you've been comfortable at, why you got fat and lazy. You got, you got to leave that behind in order to exercise and feel better. So in the first verse of, of chapter one, it says, uh, the first verse of chapter eight, it says, soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages. So let's have a little background here first. Where is Jesus at? Where are these towns and villages? What has he been doing at this point? Now we first get to learn about uh, Jesus' public ministry in uh, Luke 3.23, if someone could look that up, please. And then someone else numbers 4.3. We'll get to these. We get to know um, what's been going on at this point, what, what Jesus is doing. So Luke 3, verses 23, who has that? All right, so we know he begins his public ministry at 30 years old. And prior to this, in the book of Luke, we don't have really much about Jesus. We have about his birth and how he stayed behind at the temples, learning from the rabbis there every day. Other than that, we really aren't sure where Jesus has been at. But it says he's 30 years old. Now, this is a pretty important number and age in the Bible here, which, who has numbers 4 verse 3? All right, thank you. Which, between the ages of 30 and 50, this is the age where you start serving in the tabernacle as a priest, as a servant of God there during this time. And that's the whole Jesus was. Not only were you 30 years old when you began serving as a priest in the temple, David was also 30 years old when he started reigning as king over Israel. And also, Joseph, he was 30 years old when he became second in command only to Pharaoh himself in Egypt. So this 30 years old, it's a, it's a pretty big turning point for these people here in the Bible. And as we see, this is when Jesus started his public ministry. This is when Jesus started to leave his comfort zone. Now, Luke 4, verses 1 through 2 and 14, that's where we're going to be going next if someone would like to have those. And we get to learn what Jesus starts doing, how he's going to start leaving his comfort zone here. So Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Who could go ahead and read that? Okay, so we see Jesus, he just got baptized here to start his public ministry, got baptized. As we know, baptism is a, it's a public expression of an inward change of what's been going on. Jesus was baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist, in the Jordan River. And then afterwards, it says he left there and went out into the wilderness. So the Jordan River, it's on the border of his, his hometown uh, country or of Galilee, region of Galilee. And I'm going to try to paint this picture here. Now, Galilee, this was a region there. It'd be similar to kind of like our counties, the size-wise. So let's say Jesus, he was in uh, Tazewell County here. And it says he left the wilderness, or he left the Jordan River to go to the wilderness. Now, I think he's going into the wilderness of, let's say, Mason County in Manitou over there. That's, he was baptized. He went over there. And this is where he was uh, tempted by the devil, and it says, Jesus, he was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, to go back to the, the exercise point of what I was talking about, which you make the New Year's resolution and you feel good. You feel good for maybe a day or so. You feel like you can really go out and do things. You get this really like a sense of energy, this kind of high type sort. Now, you guys have all experienced that, right? And that's why you make these resolutions. And I think that's what Jesus was feeling here too. Or even if you just become saved and you're a Christian, you feel like you want to go out and do these things. You want to leave your comfort zone. And it says Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit being baptized and going out into the desert. Now, as he goes out into the desert, he becomes tempted by Satan. It says he went 40 days without food or water. Now, I drink a lot of water. I've already been to the bathroom about four times today. 
So that's really hard for me to do, at least. And I, I don't know about any of you if you've ever gone 40 days without food, but that's, I think that'd be really hard. But as it says, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He had the Holy Spirit with him through this to, to go out and face the devil. It says he was tempted by like all temptations. Maybe not the, in the same physical form, but the same temptation, whether it be greed, lust, any of those things. He had that temptation while he was with them. And he combated it with scripture. And he went out full of the Holy Spirit. He went out feeling good, wanting to do things, wanting to change the world, just like maybe a New Year's resolution to lose weight or something. But normally what happens to people, that kind of falls off. It gets hard for them and they quit. They no longer have that feeling of wanting to go out, that, that kind of high sense feeling of, yeah, let's go do things. But Jesus wasn't like that. He, he didn't lose that in the middle of it because that's the Holy Spirit. You don't have to lose that feeling of the Holy Spirit with you. It can keep going. It can keep you going strong. Which chapter, er, verse 14 in chapter 4. Could someone go ahead and read that please? All right, so it says he returned to Galilee. This is right after being tempted. And notice it says he was full of the Holy Spirit. He still had that high good feeling of wanting to go and do things. Even though he's been tempted and he's left his comfort zone, he still has that feeling with him because it's the Holy Spirit. You don't have to let the Holy Spirit leave that, that feeling or anything like that. You can keep going strong even when it gets hard, even when you are tempted. You don't have to give in. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He kept going through the struggles, the temptations, those uh, Mexican food of wanting to quit your, your diet and exercise. He resisted that and was able to keep going. Now, also the second part in that, it said uh, crowds and people started to notice of what was going on, what was happening. Well, we'll get into that a, a little bit later. But So he, he's out of the wilderness of Mason County of Manitou and he's back into Tazewell County here, of his home county of, in Galilee of where he's at. And then the last place we know before getting into chapter 8 of where he was is Luke 7, 11, which this will give us an idea of kind of where he is, which if someone could read that, please. All right, so he's in the village of Nain, which if Jesus' hometown is, let's say, Pekin here in Tazewell County. Nain is about five to ten miles away, so maybe about Tremont is where he's at now, where we're thinking about. So you can easily walk there in a day and go see him and things. So this is around the last place of where we know he is before we get into Luke chapter 8. And it says he has his disciples and great crowds of people are still following him, which I think people kind of, uh, I think the disciples and Jesus, they got along real well, like all the time. And um, they could have, we really don't know how, what their dynamic was like, what their friendship was. But I think we also have to remember that these are just strangers to Jesus at first. Some of the people, they, he, he just called out. He was like, you come and follow me. And they, they were in the middle of their jobs, even just fishing and they left him. So he had to go out and, um, uh, make these new friends. He had to leave his comfort zone to meet new people, which I feel like I have a, an easy enough time meeting new people and making new friends, but I know not, that's not everyone's cup of tea. They're, they're kind of shy and they don't make new friends easily. And that can be scary for people. But that brings us to our next point of you will make new friends. These new friends, these not only the disciples, but also said still great crowds of people were following him in Luke 7, 11. And as I said, you have to leave your comfort zone to start making these new friends. You can't make new friends just on the couch by yourself. That, does, that doesn't really work that way. You're by yourself. You have to go out and meet these people. And that's what Jesus was doing. He's meeting new people. He was impacting lives. And he was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, why were people wanting to follow Jesus? Why were people just wanting to quit their jobs and go and follow this guy who he's pretty new to the scene. He's 30 years old. He just started doing stuff. It's not like there is social media back then where 
they will just be like, oh yeah, yeah, this Jesus guy blows up overnight, this huge sensation and everything. This, this takes time. But here he is in his like first year of ministry and he has these great crowds of followers of just people wanting to be with him to see what this guy is talking about. And why, why are they doing this? Why are they coming out to see Jesus? Which, that's in our next verse, Luke 5, 1. Which, it explains to us of why people are coming out to see Jesus. Why did he leave his comfort zone and be tempted by the devil? And why is he doing this? So Luke 5, 1, if someone could read that. Genesaret. All right. Thank you very much. All right. It said these great crowds of people were following him and listening to the word of God. They wanted to hear what this guy had to say because they knew what he was speaking, it wasn't just him. He spoke with real authority. He had the Holy Spirit with him. And as we read, he came into the desert full of the Holy Spirit, and he came out still full of the Holy Spirit, and went on to preach to these towns. So right now he's in this region of Nain, or this town of Nain, and great crowds of people are following him. And it's because he's full of the Holy Spirit. He's preaching the word of God. He's living the gospel. It wasn't written yet at this point, but he is out there talking about and preaching the gospel. People want to be with him. He's making new friends because he's living out the gospel, the word of God. People hear this, of what he's saying, these new, this new take on the same old scriptures they've heard from the Pharisees preached down their throat. And they like it. They like what he's saying. It's life-changing things that he has here. And that's why he's making these new friends. And as our main verse, it says he, he took his 12 disciples with him. So these, these complete strangers that he's met and he's traveled along with a little bit. And along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. So he has this great crowd of people following him. His inner circle of these 12 disciples. And then also these other friends he has with him in these women. Who they're supporting him from their own uh, money. And... Not only are they supporting him, but this was against the law for them to do this. Now, during this time period, it was illegal for women to learn from rabbis. So even by just them following him around and learning and supporting him, that was an illegal thing for them to do. Now, these are also some pretty important women. Like, it calls them out by name. Like, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager. Now, there are two Herods, but whichever one there was, Herod Antipas, or regular Herod, they're pretty high up, either... Um, the controller of this region of Galilee or even another guy higher up. So no matter which one, which Herod it was, his wife, the business manager, was, was out there supporting this Jesus guy who no one's ever heard of him before. And he's just preaching the Holy the Spirit and he's just full of the Holy Spirit and really just these new ideas from the same old scriptures that they had. And these people are with him and they support him. But why, why are they supporting him? Yes, it's this cool idea of some things that happens and kind of similar to today of how like there'll be a new YouTuber that pops up and people, they want to want to support him and do some things or something like that. But these people are sticking with Jesus. And why are they supporting him? Why are they, they doing things illegal to him? Why are they becoming his friend? Which Luke 7, 47, which is just right before our, our main verses here in Luke 8, it's going to tell us of why they're supporting Jesus. So Luke 7, 47, if anyone has that. Therefore I tell you, for many standards have been forgiven for the which he loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Because of their love, because of much love, that's why they are supporting Jesus here. Contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. Now, the verse we just read, uh, Jesus is in um, a house of a Pharisee. And we get told about this immoral woman who comes in. We're not sure completely of what all she's done, but it says she's an immoral woman. And he's eating. 
back during that time, they, they reclined when they ate, they laid down and there was a table low. And she comes in and she starts washing his feet with her tears and using her hair to rub his feet dry and anointing him with these expensive perfumes and oils. In this house of a Pharisee, of the people who are supposed to be the real religious leaders at the time, there's just some woman barging in and doing these things. Now, why would she be anointing his head and washing his feet? It was customary when you were entering into a guest's house for the guests to provide a foot washing for you from their servants. They'd wash your feet because they don't have the closed-toed shoes that we have. They had open-toed shoes. It's, they're in the desert. It's real dusty. Your feet would get dirty. And when you come inside, you don't want them to track in the dirt and all that. And they've neglected to do this for Jesus. The Pharisees, the people who are supposed to be up here, the examples of the people, they neglected it. But here comes this immoral woman who's supposed to be down here, who goes here and washes his feet with her tears of all things and dries them off with her hair and uses expensive perfumes to anoint its head. That was also a custom at the time to anoint a guest's head when they come in to show that they're cleansed. And here she is doing all these things. And the Pharisees are like, Jesus, don't you know this woman is bad? Like, why, why are you letting her do all this? And then Jesus says, it's because of the love that she has for me. She knows her sins are forgiven because she has many sins. The Pharisees think they're all righteous. They don't even recognize their own sins. So they're not showing the love to Jesus, showing that he can forgive. They, they don't understand that. But here's this immoral woman showing that. This woman becomes Jesus' friend and wants to support him because of the love she has for Jesus. Now, not only were the people following Jesus because of their love and supporting him, they were kind of becoming a, a new family, which this is, brings us to the second part of our, our main verses here of 18 through 21 in Luke. But Jesus was welcoming them, welcoming them to the family. It's creating this family of God, this family of Christ, which in Romans 8, 14, it tells us how we're all children of God, how we belong to a family, which Romans 8, 14, if someone could read that. Thank you. Children of God, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all welcome to the family of God. Now, a family, some of you might like your family. Some of you may not like your family. That's, that's not for me to decide or know all the dynamics of that. But this family of God we're talking about is this welcoming family, is this family of love where we support each other. Now, I'm going to read verses 19 through 21 in Luke chapter 8 again, where it says, Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to see you. Jesus replied, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. Now, when I first read the scripture, I thought Jesus was kind of being a jerk. I thought like, here are his mother and his brother. They're here to see him. And he's like, oh, that's all right. I don't need to see him. All, all these other people, I, I got them for me. And I'm like, wow, Jesus, that's, that's real. Uh, it's not nice of him to say that about his family. Because Jesus, he's in this town of Nain around there. And his hometown of Nazareth, it's only about five miles away, like I said. So his family, they heard about what all Jesus is doing. Maybe they, want their first, they went there just for some free food at that point. I don't know. And so that's, I always kind of thought, well, Jesus, he's being mean to his family. They, they traveled this way, maybe a day's walk or so to come and see him. But now I don't, I don't think Jesus was dissenting when he said that my brothers and my mother are all those who hear God's word and obey it. I don't think that at all now. I think Jesus was saying that because he felt the love of his family from all these other people around him now because they were supporting him because of their love for him. He felt that family atmosphere no matter where he went because he made these new friends. Yes, he had to leave his own hometown. He had to go somewhere different. He's never been before, but he was making new friends. He's being part of a family. 
He's being part of something greater. And I think Jesus felt that wherever he went. Now, sure, if you'd go back to Nazareth, he'd have that still homecoming feeling of finally being with his blood relatives. Like, if any of you have been away for a while, you know, it's always nice to go back home. Todd's been here for six months now, and I'm sure he's really excited to leave here for me to get done preaching so he can go back home and be with his family. But I think Todd also recognizes that we are his family here. We all are. We all get to experience in this love, and we all support Todd. We love Todd. And it's because he's been, well, doing what Jesus has been doing. He's been speaking with the Holy Spirit. He's letting the Holy Spirit speak through him. And that's what we're all called to do. But in Mark 14, or Mark 15, verses 40 through 41, I think this part is really cool here. Which Mark 15, 40 through 41. Someone could read that. All right, so we hear that the, here are some women again. They're following Jesus. I don't know, maybe they're, he was really good looking and that's why women followed him. But at this point in the scripture, Jesus is crucified. This is during the crucifixion. And we learn that there are these women here still with him, which one of them, Mary Magdalene, which in Luke chapter 8, it says, among them were Mary Magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons. So in chapter 8 of Luke, We have this Mary Magdalene following him. And then also talks about uh, Mary, the mother of James, which that's Jesus' mom. And then we have these other women, like Salome. They're with him. And they're with him at the crucifixion. And it says other women who had been with him since Galilee. And if we go back to chapter 8 of Luke, that's where he is right here in Galilee. He has these women following him. They've stayed with him throughout his ministry at this point, even when he's dying being crucified, being tortured, even though he did nothing wrong. And these women knew it. They're still with him, supporting him throughout all of that, like a family. That's, that's what it's all about. It's about being a family and being with people no matter what. Being with your fellow believers. They stuck with him throughout all he went through, throughout the good. They're here with him in the bad. They've been with him the entire time, just like a family does. A family supports you throughout all of it. And that's what we can have. That's what we can know going forward. Just like as Todd's been here, he's had the family here with us. His family, his true family of uh, his blood family is back in Alabama, but we're here here. But we are here right now with Todd. His family, his brothers and sisters in Christ. No matter where he goes, he knows that there are Christians, that they're a part of a family. That's what it's all about here. It's about We can have this family no matter where we are. We can feel this love for one another. We can support one another. They're going to be with you till the end. And I think that's what Jesus meant when he said, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. I don't think he was being mean to his parents or to his brothers. I think he was saying, I have family right here that support me and they love me throughout all that I do. And we can have that every day too. Because as it says in Romans 8, 14, all who believe, all who have the Holy Spirit are brothers and sisters in Christ. And one other thing Todd has been saying is we have all these benefits and I don't know why people wouldn't want to be a Christian. Which if you can have your family with you no matter where you go, maybe it's not your blood relatives, but you have this extended family of Christ, why wouldn't you want to be a Christian? We can have this support. We can have love for us no matter where we go, even when it gets hard and tough. No matter where we are in this journey, whether it's in the desert or whether we're being tortured or even just in the good times where we have fellowship with one another. We have this family here with us in this body of Christ. That's what Jesus is trying to get through at this point. That's what the gospel is about, speaking in these chapters through here. Of yes, it's going to be hard. You're going to have hard points in your life where you're going to be tempted by the devil. Where, yes, maybe you're going to go through hard times physically. But in the end, the friends and the family you make are worth it. 
Now, as the praise team comes forward, if, if any of you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, we, you don't have to go through it alone. These, these trials you're going through in your life, you have a family here with you who wants to support you, which thank you, Nick, for coming up here and giving a little testimony for us, which he knows we're here with him. We're here to support him now. And that's what we want to do for everyone who's a believer in Christ. You have this family atmosphere where we're going to support you and love you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, just thank you for everything that you have done for us, for letting us be adopted into your family, into this believers and body of Christ, Lord. And that's amazing that no matter where we go, we can feel the love and just support from people who care for us. And thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit to help us do these things. So we don't have to feel just great at the beginning, but we can feel great going out once we are victorious. And yes, it may be hard, but you're with us. And this body of believers is with us throughout all of this. And thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done for us already and continue to guide us throughout today. And thank you, Lord, for sending us Todd and just for all that, that Todd has done for us. And please keep him safe on his travel home and support his ministry wherever he goes. And we love you, Lord, and thank you very much. Amen.